Michael Elegon shot February 3rd, 2012. Sammy Yatim shot July 27, 2013. Michael McIsaac shot December 2nd, 2013. This is the story of the shooting of Michael McIsaac. Was his death preventable? God almighty. What are we seeing? This is the first video that was taken after the shooting. This is 20 seconds after the 20 seconds after the shots. He's on the ground, reeling in pain. Piecing together the details of what happened to her brother Michael has become Joanne McIsaac's life mission. It infuriates me. It infuriates me. I think an animal, an animal would have been given better treatment. Ajax, Ontario, a bedroom community 45 minutes east of Toronto. December 2nd, 2013. That cold winter day is forever imprinted in the minds of eyewitnesses and police officers who encounter Michael McIsaac that day. A 47-year-old construction worker with a history of epilepsy, he was prone to seizures. This one triggered what appeared to be a psychotic episode. His wife, Marianne, found him totally disoriented when he woke up. I noticed he was a little bit anxious and tossing and turning, and, and then eventually I, I witnessed him having a seizure um, in his bed. It, it happened a few times until the morning. Uh, I think he had about two or three, and then I, I just tried to make him as comfortable as I could, and then I, I knew he would sleep it off. 9.45 a.m. Marianne was working from home, on the line with the client, when her husband burst into the room. And I looked, and he walked past me, and he was completely naked. And he, he was very agitated. Upset. He was saying things that weren't making sense. He was cursing a bit, just rambling on, completely not himself. It was like, where did Michael go? Who is this person? It was so not Michael. I was trying to hang on to his arms to not let him leave. And he got very upset and he was trying to break free. And then during that struggle, I did get hit a few times, but so he it was like you. he was in delirious. He didn't know what he was saying, what he was doing. I was screaming, of course, because I'm, I'm terrified of what's going on. My sister came, and when she heard me scream, she said, what are you doing to my sister? And Michael got very upset, and he went after her too, and there was a struggle. 10.03 a.m. McIsaac runs out of his home naked. Marianne follows, but can't keep up. It isn't long before 911 calls start coming in. Control 9101, 9402 for domestic, 91 zone. He's just fled the scene, looking for a naked male. Uh, Michael McIsaac, 47. No weapons on the male. I just thought, you know, they'll, they'll see he's naked. I just thought they were going to pick him up and bring him home or take him to the hospital. <laughs> 10 16 a.m. A witness calls 911 from his truck. Do you require police car ambulance? Uh, police for a naked guy. Yeah, where do you see him right now? Right now I'm following him. He's, I, I, he stopped and I talked him into going home. He goes, he lives down here. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure you get home, okay, buddy? Just be careful. We're not sure if maybe there's some mental health issues. All right. We don't. We don't know. You know, if you may be violent or anything right. like that. So he's cutting into a plaza now. The teacher started screaming, "Miss Natasha, Miss Natasha, there's a naked man running up the road." So I ran to the back of the building and um, saw a gentleman. And he was completely naked, and he was covering his private area. 
Natasha Khan runs the daycare in this plaza. 10.20 a.m. She sees McIsaac. Did you feel threatened at all? No. It was more or less, is he okay? You know, like, why are you running the road like that? In one 911 call, you can hear McIsaac's voice in the background. He's clearly confused. Hold on, it's cold. Sir, be careful and stay in your truck, okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, back up. Back up and I'll put it down. Back up. What's he saying? He's telling me to put the window down. He's getting aggressive. Okay. But I'm okay. I will as soon as you back away. Back away. Hey! Fucking. Holy shit, now he's on another car, eh? Okay, what's he doing? He's attacking the other car. He noticed me in my car, in my driveway, and came over to the car and began banging on my window and yelling um, loudly to open the thing door. Did you see him right now? Yeah, he's now banging on my window. Open up! 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 No. 10.21 a.m. Shelly Allen Groves calls 911 from her car. And um, I was still on 911 at this point, so I was sort of giving them a play-by-play -play that he's now um, speaking with me in a raised, angry tone. No, no I'm on the phone with the police. Don't talk. Listen, don't yes. talk to him, okay? Okay, fine. Yeah, okay, he's going away. I let him know that I was on the phone with 911. If he needed help, someone would be on their way. I hope that that might de-escalate things. Unfortunately, it didn't. He turned from my window, went towards the rock garden, picked up the rock, turned towards me, started towards me with the rock. That's when I felt um, at a threat. Are you in your driveway? Shit. Oh, he's picking up a rock. Okay, drive away. Please. I'm driving away. I'm gone, okay. When I caught sight of him again, he was up on, on my front patio and then picked up a piece of patio furniture and was banging on the window. He was advancing with um, the metal table leg raised, like a baseball bat, sort of a, above his head. Okay, the cops are now coming, I can okay, see them. I just want you to stay in your vehicle, okay? I'm in my, I'm in my vehicle, no problem. The cops are coming. He's got a work and he's got a table in his hand. Oh! 10.23 a.m., three Durham police officers arrive on the scene one by one. It's a chaotic situation and things move very quickly. McIsaac is holding a table leg and shouting. An officer named Brian Taylor orders him to stop and drop it. But McIsaac keeps moving. The officer shoots McIsaac once in the shoulder and once in the stomach. The interaction between them is a mere 12 seconds. Oh, shit. Oh, God. This short video clip is taken by a witness moments after the shooting. It shows McIsaac on the ground, bleeding. Officer Brian Taylor would later testify that McIsaac was being aggressive and that he thought, I'm going to have that metal bar driven right through my skull. I was fearing for my safety. For the next 14 hours, McIsaac struggled for his life. He had lost so much blood by the time he got to the trauma center that they could not give him any pain meds because his blood pressure was so low. Mm. So that was uh, very difficult. He suffered. So you're watching your brother die slowly. Sorry. Less than 24 hours after Marianne saw her husband bolt from their home naked, he was dead. I just kept thinking it's a bad dream. I'm going to wake up. And I remember going in the home by cab. I, and I walked through the door at home 
and I saw his running shoes. And it was the most empty, heart-wrenching feeling. Sir, drop the knife, sir. Sir, drop the knife. Drop the knife. That's it. When we come back, police officers defend their right to use lethal force. Is the expectation that I lose an eye, I lose a, a limb, I'm, I'm disabled for the rest of my life. Those three pol police officers show up to that scene and one of them gets killed. December 2013. On a cold day in Ajax, Ontario, Officer Brian Taylor fatally shot Michael McIsaac. Life seemed full of hope when the McIsaacs got married five years earlier. Since his death, his siblings have been on a mission to determine how the interaction with the police could have ended less tragically. What's down here? This is where we work on all the things we have related to Michael's case. Okay. So what's all this? This is the information we've compiled in the last four years. About? About Michael's shooting. What transpired. So it's like the TikTok of what happened. Yes. This particular board deals with the entire interaction from the time the officer arrived until the shots were fired. Joanne has created what looks like a crime lab, reliving over and over those crucial seconds before her brother was shot. Not only does it show that Michael was almost shot instantaneously, but that there was no effort put in to de-escalate. And we feel it could have been handled much differently. Had either one of them gotten out of the car, um, offered Michael a blanket, tried to de-escalate, as they say they do, uh, this situation, we wouldn't be here today, put it that way. We'd still have Michael, we wouldn't be here today. I got two assignments, one at 983 and the other one at 85 But that's not how the authorities see it. An independent investigation into the death cleared Officer Taylor and concluded that, quote, the officer's use of lethal force against Mr. McIsaac was legally justified. And it also ruled that McIsaac was a real threat. We reached out to Officer Taylor, but he didn't want to talk. His lawyer told us he just wants to put this matter behind him. We wanted to know how often do incidents like this happen in Canada? Our CBC investigation revealed that since the year 2000, there have been at least 461 fatal encounters with the police, and the number of cases we could identify where an officer was convicted, only two. Nobody walks away from these incidents um, unscathed. Tom Stematakis is a police officer and the president of the Canadian Police Association. He says officers are often placed in situations where they have to make split-second decisions. So help me understand, you get a 911 call, you show up, and there's a man who's naked. What's the thought process that goes through your mind? If the person has a weapon, I'm not, I'm not, and they're not communicating with me, and in fact, if what they're doing is threatening me or indicating that they're gonna harm me, I'm not gonna go and try and wrestle with that person. Why not? Well, why would I? I got a family that I want to go home to. I've got other activities that I'm involved with. I'm a person. Do you, do you, would you ever walk into a situation where there, it was likely that you'd be harmed? I'm also not a trained police officer. I also don't have the privilege or the responsibility of being assigned a gun that I'm allowed to use. But are you, are you suggesting that because I have some training and I've been issued a firearm or other force options tools, then part of that means I, I, I put myself at risk? I think like I accept the fact yeah. that I'm... That I think the public assumes that. That's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous if that's an expectation. Uh, new gas yellow barrel verified already, that's fine. Good. Yeah. No other weapons. Pull and draw them. Officers say they never draw their guns unless they have to. So police around the country are trying to equip officers uh, with different options, else. including more de-escalation training. Okay, right. Ten. Ten. 
In Halifax, <laughs> it looks something like this. Copy, on scene. I got a knife. I know what to do with it. Okay. I'm not gonna hurt anybody here. I'm not gonna hurt you guys. Okay, Kyle, you, do you, I understand that uh, you're feeling upset. And you said you have a knife, and you say you wanna go, and you, you're gonna do it right here. Well, I don't want that to happen, okay? In a controlled environment, officers role play in how to talk someone out of hurting himself. So I'm hoping that you and I can, can, can keep that respect going and that we can, we can have a conversation to resolve this so nothing worse happens, okay? But I'm gonna, I need to tell you this. The goal of this training is how to calm a person down using as little force as possible. All right. Gotta go, move, 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 move. Under power. You're under arrest, Kyle. But officers also say time isn't always on their side. Kyle, just relax. Put your arm out like an airplane. Do it now. And some situations just require instant decisions. You look at me. For Joanne McIsaac, change in policing just isn't happening fast enough. Hi, you have reached your personal mailbox of Nelly Sadie. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to take your call presently. She's reaching out to families around the country who've also lost a loved one after a fatal interaction with the police. Hey Ellie, it's Joanne McIsaac. I hope you're feeling okay. I had a couple of questions um, regarding some details with your brother's death. If you could give me a call back, you have my number. Uh, I'll wait to hear from you. Thanks, bye. She wants to know if there is a pattern. It'll show you where the problem areas are. Mm -hmm. So if a lot of people who are in, let's say, mental distress are, are, are shot, then there needs to be training on how to handle those. So we, so we reduce the numbers, not continue to increase the numbers. For the last four years, Joanne has been demanding that the province of Ontario make it mandatory for police to be trained to de-escalate situations with those in a mental crisis. But dissatisfied with the results, She's stepping up her game. She has teamed up with a prominent civil rights lawyer, Alan Young. And the problem with escalation and de-escalation is about the people who are unpredictable. Together, they want to bring a legal challenge that basically says that police forces that don't train their officers to de-escalate are violating the constitutional rights of those with mental health issues. And what that means is that in the future, Every time there's a shooting, if you can find that the police weren't, the officer shooting wasn't trained, the entire police force becomes liable, so everybody becomes liable. But what if better training is just one piece of the puzzle? That's what some experts have been trying to figure out. It's very difficult to talk somebody down who's in the midst of a mental health crisis. Ron Hoffman worked for two decades overseeing mental health training with the Ontario Police College. The focus should be on how did it get to that situation to begin with? How did we have an individual who we knew had a mental health problem in the community? Uh, how did it get to the point where he uh, got to the stage where he's threatening somebody else? Now he's been trying to figure out how the police can intervene before there is a real crisis. He helped create a program to do just that. Yeah, so you can see here the different indicators right here, hallucinations, command hallucinations. Now the section C is violence indicators, which is very important as well too. Indicators of self-harm, self-injurious attempt in the last seven days. So they tried to hurt themselves in the last seven days. Uh, they've had a suicide plan within the last 30 days. Now here are the risk scores right here. Um, so out of 10, a 10 out of 10 in terms of risk of harm to self or uh, to self. So in your opinion, what will go next? What would happen? We would be heading to the hospital at this point. Okay. Not only does it log the interactions, but it also alerts a mental health professional to intervene. 13 Ontario police forces are already using this program on the road, giving officers access to it in their cars. So once we fill out the form, we get the risk analysis. So. It's a tremendous uh, change in the way police are operating. Joanne knows the big changes in policing she's been fighting for may take years. But her efforts are beginning to pay off. 
Just this week, the Ontario government announced that it will overhaul police training in part as a result of what happened to her brother. We've tried everything. We've met with the Premier's office. We've met with the Ministry. We've met with the Attorney General. We have written to every Attorney General across every province across the country. We've done everything they tell you to do and, and then more. So this is, uh, we're just going to continue the process until we get the answers or the changes that we need. Control 9101, 9402 for domestic, 91 zone. Just be advised though, he is on local, severe MHA aggression towards police. He's got a weapon, he's got a table in his hand. Oh shit, the guns are called, God. 